open our Bibles to 2 Thessalonians. There we are. 2 Thessalonians 2. Thank you for blessing me with your singing this morning. Those in the back, we love you. You ought to just sit up front once in a while and hear everybody sing over you. It's a, it's a, t- a delight. Or if you'd like to stand on this platform and hear them, that's fine too. This morning we're going to focus our attention on answering a few questions that came out of our last sermon in 2 Thessalonians 2. And I'd like to read the text and then note the questions we'll be addressing. 2 Thessalonians 2 will begin in verse 5. He's talking about the day of the Lord. Don't you remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? Now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them a strong delusion that they should should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Two questions that came out, the first one that people just made comments or followed up with me, and I thought that's a good thing to look at, were related to verses 6 and 7. First of all, who or what is restraining the man of lawlessness right now? What will happen that that restraint or that restrainer will be removed? What is that that will be a an introduction to or the gateway for the arrival, the parousia of the lawless one who will be empowered by Satan. We're going to look at that this morning. And then in verses, the last half of 10 and 11 and 12, to whom does God send a strong delusion that they might believe the lie? And why? Why does that happen? So we're going to look at that, uh, I think, next week. I was going to try to get it all in today, but at a men's breakfast yesterday, I was encouraged by some men around bacon to keep it short. (laughs) And there was no way that I was going to do that, Mr. Jim Glupker. So I uh, broke it down, and I think I'll be long two weeks in a row now with being able to handle it. It's really a great text and one that we ought to be aware of, Because when the Lord returns, as we just sang about, it is going to be well for some, and it is not going to be well for others. To address these two texts further, then, requires knowing what the Thessalonians already knew because Paul had told them. Verse 5, don't you remember that when I was with you, I told you these things? Things that he told them while he was in Thessalonica, and apparently these things that he told them gave them a better understanding of what Paul meant when he writes about the restrainer, the restraint, and the delusion that is to come. Thankfully, we have Paul's extended teaching about the church being caught up to meet the Lord in the air, 1 Thessalonians 4, and his teaching about the day of the Lord, 1 Thessalonians 5, So God has inscripturated for us what Paul taught the Thessalonians that is necessary or valid for us today because we believe in the sufficiency of God's word, that he revealed to us everything that we need to know for life and godliness. Sometimes not everything we want to know. So as we talk about these things, we will say what we can say that is true And it may still leave a question or two out there, but we'll do the best that we can. This morning, I'm going to address the question by considering what God has revealed then about this restraint, this restrainer, and the uh, day of the Lord and the place of the church in the context of Christ coming again. The question we ask, really, that will set the stage and where we want to end up with this morning is, 
Is the imminent return of Jesus Christ a blessed hope for you? Or is it a cause for fear and uncertainty? God revealed truth to us so we would be ready when Jesus comes. Let's pray and then let's open the text. Thank you, God, that you have not left us to our own thinking. We know that these are truths that uh, have been determined before the foundation of, of time, that you had set an agenda to reveal your glory, not only through creation, not only in spite of the fall, but through the fall, the plan of redemption. And the end of the story is that Christ is coming to make all things new. And we delight in that hope. Now as we consider these questions, God, may we not only seek knowledge and, and how to apply Scripture here, but may we also then be transformed and, and renewed in our mind and thinking so that as we leave today with our minds renewed and centered around the gospel of Jesus Christ, we will go back into our life where all the cares of this life await us with renewed hope, renewed mission and purpose and that we will represent you well until Jesus comes. We delight in knowing you, God. Thank you for loving us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to break this down. It's more of a teaching today, and I suppose I, that's my inclination to go to anyway, but I would like to teach more resp responding to this question about the day of the Lord and the restraining that is going on and when that will end and the day of the Lord will begin in light of the coming of the lawless one. So in the notes we put down that there are three relevant reminders of what Paul revealed in 1 Thessalonians that help us to know how to answer these questions. And I go to that because, we, again, Paul says, don't you remember I taught you these things? We don't have all that he taught them while he was with them, but we know what he taught that God wanted us to know in light of 2 Thessalonians 2. So that's the plan that we have here this morning. Paul's prophecies about end times were intended, number one, uh, a relevant reminder. They were intended, the prophecies of God, to comfort the church in Thessalonica. What he was revealing about that which was to come was to bring comfort to the believers, to the church, the saints in Thessalonica. Notice with me, if you flip back in your Bible or scroll back in your uh, personal device, whatever you have there, to chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians, he began, and we're going to go up verse 18. In verse 13, he said, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those that have fallen asleep, and then talks about the coming of the day of the Lord, to catch the saints up into the air, to meet the Lord in the air. But notice as he ends that section, verse 18, therefore... Comfort one another with these words. The, the purpose of the prophecy was not to alarm the church, but to comfort the body of Christ. We go to chapter 5, and he now begins concerning verse 1, the times and the seasons. You have no need that I should write to you. You yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. So now we have the day of the Lord in a section in chapter 5. And again, we studied this already. But notice when he comes down to the end of the chapter, of this section, excuse me, verse 11. Therefore, in light of these truths about the day of the Lord, Comfort each other and edify one another just as you are already doing. So there is a pattern of here's a revelation or a prophetic uh, statement about what is to come. This is for your comfort. This is how you comfort one another. In chapter 2 of 2 Thessalonians, as he's dealt with the text, verses 1 through 12, notice in verse um, 16, the end of this section, now may our God, our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father, whom has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. So we just see a pattern here that we ought not to miss in the text. The prophetic literature is meant to bring comfort to the people of God, the letters written to the church of Jesus Christ in Thessalonica. That's a, re a reminder from the text. A second relevant reminder for understanding our study this morning is that Paul's prophecies about end times should warn or are to warn those who are not God's people. 
There's a warning about those who are not ready for the return of Jesus Christ. Go to chapter 5 of 1 Thessalonians. We've read the first verse there. We'll pick it up in verse 2. You yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord is going to come as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that day should overtake you as a thief. So there's something for the unbeliever here related to prophetic literature, and there are those then who are not ready for the return of Jesus Christ, and you shouldn't be comforted in your status, but rather you should be warned the day of the Lord is coming. It's a day of judgment and wrath. It's when the King of kings and Lord of lords settles up accounts perfectly according to his perfect standard. We can be reminded of what this looked like in the nation of of, uh, Assyria, in the city of Nineveh, when Jonah finally came and proclaimed, in 40 days, the Lord is going to destroy this wicked city. And they heard the warning, and they repented, and they sought God's favor. They understood what the text or the prophetic literature was for. It was a warning for them to change their way. And they avoided the destruction that had been promised because of their wickedness. A third relevant teaching or or, or promise or, 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 or thought that we ought to grab out of Paul's teaching already that will help us, Paul's prophecies about the end times are full of hope for the church of Jesus Christ and for the church in Thessalonica in particular. So when he writes about the restrainer and the restraint and, and the delusion that's going to come, again, remember, there is an emphasis, emphasis in Paul's writings on the hope of the church of Jesus Christ. Go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, if you would, please. Verse 19, for what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For you are our glory and our joy. The ministry of Paul and Silas here to these uh, saints who had now uh, put their faith in Christ. They were ready and this is the hope and the joy that they will be found ready in Christ when Jesus Christ comes again. So Paul speaks about hope in, in chapter 2. Go down to chapter 4 of First Thessalonians. Go down to verse 13 there. I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have what? No hope. So you are supposed to, with your hope, be able to address what happens to those who die before the coming of Jesus Christ because the coming of Jesus Christ is a great hope or provides great hope for you. Chapter 5, again, a section on the day of the Lord, verse 8. But let us who are of the day, not of the night, so the believers, the church of Thessalonica, be sober, self-controlled, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. So again, the, the believers are to have this hope about the return of Jesus Christ. It's very clear in Paul's writing here in his letters to the Thessalon- uh, Thessalonian church. We just read the text, but again in verses 16 and 17 of 2 Thessalonians 2, he speaks again of the hope that they have in relationship to the coming of Jesus Christ and the um, end time when God is going to settle accounts with the earth and make all things new and there will be eternal life for those who are in Christ and eternal judgment for those who are not uh, in Christ, whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life. Now it's important for us, I think, to understand a little bit more about this concept of hope to understand our text and why we are going to make some conclusions about what Paul says in 2 Thessalonians about the restrainer and that which restrains. In all of Paul's letters, we find him encouraging hope for the church in relationship to the coming of Jesus Christ, always. And this hope that they have is rooted in the person of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ and the work of Jesus Christ. 
So I want to just go through a list of some of the statements that Paul actually makes in other texts besides his letters to the Thessalonians about this hope to help us understand the hope that it helps instruct or give us information for determining the answer to our question in 2 Thessalonians 2. All right, let's go to Romans 15, verse 4. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. Paul writes this near the end of his life. He writes 1 Thessalonians at the beginning of his public or, or his uh, ministry and writing letters to the churches. We have the comfort, he says, to the Romans of this hope of salvation that is ours in Jesus Christ. Down a little bit further. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So hope is incredibly important as Paul writes to the Romans about the coming of Christ and the work of God, the God who is the God of hope for his people. Paul will write to Titus, his son in the faith, in chapter 2, verse 11, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Man, we should be so excited looking for the return of Jesus Christ. It's our blessed hope. Paul will write to the Romans in chapter 5. Not only that, but we are also glory in tribulations, the hardship of life now, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perver- perseverance character, and character produces hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. With the Holy Spirit indwelling us as the children of God, and it gives us a hope in Jesus Christ so that when he comes, we will be delighted at his appearing. In his letter to the church in Colossae, and you who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, you you once were the enemies of God and his return would not be a good thing, yet now he has reconciled you in the body of his flesh through death, brought into the very body of Christ to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. And all God's people said... (laughs) That is such a great truth right there. If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven of which I, Paul, am a minister. The hope of the gospel is that in Christ my sins have been imputed to Jesus Christ who died for them. I have been forgiven. His righteousness has been imputed to me and I have been adopted into the family of God by the Spirit of God and I stand now to go to my Father's house righteous in Jesus Christ. (laughs) That's our hope, right? Second Thessalonians 2, we've already read this verse. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and, our, and God our Father, who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace. Don't miss that. It's not by our works. It's not what we deserve. It's by grace. May that hope by grace comfort your hearts and establish you in every good uh, word and work. And again, back to Colossians. Uh, To them, God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ is in us. We've been given the spirit of God. Well, actually then say, John will write also about this in this text that we can't leave out as we talk about hope. Beloved, or behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Who? Jesus Christ. Beloved, now we are the children of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed... We shall be like him, for we will see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him 
purifies himself, even as he is pure. What a great hope that one day we are going to see Jesus Christ when he comes and we're going to be like him. Not God's, we are going to be righteous. And now we pursue righteousness in our life. We are purifying ourselves in this context. Last text we look at in this section, and that is this. The unbeliever does not have this hope. This is the hope only of the child of God who's been adopted into his family because of the work of the Spirit of God and regeneration and adoption built upon or rooted in the work of Jesus Christ. That is how we find this hope that is ours. But Paul writes to the Gentile or the believers now, therefore remember that you once Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ. Before the gospel came to Ephesus, you were without Christ. You were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of the promise, and notice this, having no hope and without God in the world. A hope that says, I look forward to the coming of Jesus Christ. I look forward to being presented in, and in the presence of a holy God, not because of what I've done, but because of what Jesus Christ has done. Right? That's the hope of the believer. Anybody who wants to stand in their own works is in trouble because we know that by our works no man is justified before God. It's in Christ Jesus. So when we talk about these reminders of the purposes of prophecy, it is to comfort the church. That's why we have these words from Paul. It is to warn unbelievers of what is yet to come. And it is also to encourage hope for the church of Jesus Christ. So when we take that, when Paul says, well, you remember when I was with you, I told you these things, there's a breath there that we can look at and so we can pick up on some of them and we can add to that to develop some background for why he will now say these things in verses six and seven. So I want to give a clarifying response to questions about Paul's teaching in 2 Thessalonians 2. And I wanted to do two up front. Uh, there's the two questions about the restrainer and also about the delusion that will be sent in verses 11 and 12. We're going to focus the rest of our time on verses 6 and 7. So let's read them again to get our context. Verse 6, 2 Thessalonians 2. And now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. We think things are worse now than they've ever been. I suppose the the fall has created the the devolution, and how do you call it? Not evolution, but going the other way. We're devolving, there's the word I can use. Things are going away and growing worse. I I get it in that context. But remember to the church in Thessalonica, they were already struggling and suffering great persecution. To the degree, they said, knowing what we know about the day of the Lord and the the wrath of God and, and suffering, are we in that day? And he goes, how could that be possible? But the restrainer was already restraining wickedness at the time of Paul writing the letter to the, to the Thessalonians. And he has continued to be restrained all the way up to 2022, October 9. But one day, he will not be restrained anymore. So that's what we want to look at. The question now, who or what is restraining this man of lawlessness empowered by Satan, as the text will tell us in verse 8, from in, uh, initiating his plan for world dominance, which is what he wants. He wants to raise his throne above the throne of God. He wants to destroy the people and the promises of God. He delights in the hope that he has that he will one day be worshipped as God by all of creation. He is being restrained. He's at work, but he's being restrained. We gave the clearest and only reasonable answer in our study of this text last time when we were going through a little bit more of an overview, and that is God is the only one who is sovereign over creation, sovereign over Satan and the Antichrist, who can restrain him. 
We know this even in the picture of Job. Remember we looked at when God removed his restraint for a moment, you saw what Satan did with his powers and his abilities to do everything he could to get Job to curse God. And so we know that there's a restraint now, and aren't you thankful for that? That if the enemy, the wicked one, Satan, were allowed to have at the world now without God protecting us, we would be in big trouble. (laughs) So what we have is a simple answer. There's only one who is sovereign over all of his creation, including Satan, the devil, who has no authority equal with or superior to God. God is not in a dualistic match with Satan, but he is restraining and one day he will let him go. God is not only sovereign of crea- over creation, he's sovereign over time. It will not happen until he says so. I'm reading through the Gospels right now, and it's interesting how often the, the, um, the enemy wants to push the issue for Christ to either proclaim himself as a Messiah before the time is right, or for the crowds or the enemy to kill him before the time is right. And God says, no, that's not going to happen. Jesus says, my time is not yet. He will go all the way through until he can say, it is finished, and then he lays down his life for us. He is sovereign over time and over all of creation. We can be thankful for that. But can we be more specific? Is it more specific, or can we get clearer, make clearer statements about God's means for restraining Satan and his desire Satan's desire to establish his kingdom in the world. Now, you have to remember, Satan was trying to do this 2,000 years ago. He, he was trying to do this in the garden. He was trying to do this in the days of Noah. And go back, Cain and Abel, Noah, and Babel. He's been trying to destroy the people of God in the life of Esther. You just go through the program and the story of scriptures God has revealed. He's wanted to destroy the purpose and plan of God for redemption since the beginning. And he can't. Is there a means by which God now is preserving his perfect plan and restraining the enemy? Three premises I'll give and then I'll make some statements of conclusion. Premise number one. I think you'll see where we're going with this as we work our way through the text. Premise number one, Jesus promised to build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against her. True? No matter how the gates of hell are fortified, they will not be able to resist the advancement of the gospel of Jesus Christ by the church of Jesus Christ. Remember, gates are meant to keep people out. And the gates of hell will not prevail against the church of Jesus Christ. This is in Matthew 16, verse 18, as uh, he asked Peter, who do men say that I am? And he said, you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said, I also say to you um, that you are Peter, and upon this rock, I believe that's his confession, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. There is the advancing kingdom of Jesus Christ in the world today with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We go on to the next verse, and we notice, and I will give you to the apostle, to Peter, to the disciples, to the church, the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So we have this promise of Jesus to build his church. The gates of hell will not, the kingdom of darkness will not be able to stand against that. And God has given the church the keys of the kingdom. I believe that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. The rock, which is the confession of who Jesus Christ is and why he came. And that is going to allow the church to advance against the darkness that is there today, the kingdom of Satan, who has been given privilege to rule under his authority or under the authority of God at this time. Matthew 28, remember Jesus said this, 
to his disciples as he's getting ready to leave, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. So what we have here in this first part that we want to develop as a, as a premise is that the church of Jesus Christ has the authority of Jesus Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ which advances into the kingdom of darkness and brings slaves to sin uh, and dead to sin out of death and slavery into the glorious light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's a premise. Are you with me so far? Do you agree with that premise? Good, three. The rest of you all try to work on, all right? <laughs> Premise number two. Empowered by the Holy Spirit, the church of Jesus Christ will storm the enemy's strongholds with the powerful gospel of Jesus Christ. So when Luke writes the book of Acts as the gospels have been completed, but you shall receive, uh, they were wondering, is Christ going to come now? Is now the time of the kingdom? And Jesus says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you'll be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now just to connect this statement to our st uh, text in, in Thessalon uh, 2 Thessalonians, the ends of the earth were Paul bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ, empowered by the Spirit of God, to unbelievers in Thessalonica, Gentiles, so that they also would hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's the progression of the church of Jesus Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. We can go on further and say this, that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we can make this statement, as the body is one, talking about the believers, the, the local church assembly, and we, that's the focus of the text here in 1 Corinthians 12, as the body is one and has many members, but all the members are of that one body, being many are one body, so also is Christ. Verse 13, I forgot to put in there. And that is, it says, for we were all baptized with or by one spirit into this one body. So when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we are baptized by the spirit into this body of Christ. We are now the church of Jesus Christ. And the analogy is we are like the presence of Christ on the earth, his church. He is the head. We are the body. We represent him and dwelt by and empowered by the spirit of God. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? That that's our position that's our privilege. Now we can go out with the gospel of Jesus Christ, empowered by the Spirit of God, and know that the gates of hell cannot prevail against us. No matter how wicked it gets out there in our world, we come with the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it can transform men and women in a powerful way as they are born again by the work of the Spirit of God. That's how we storm the gates of hell. The church has been given that position and that responsibility. Premise number three, not only are we the body of Christ and the church has been given the keys to the kingdom and a mission, a commission to go into all the world with the authority of Christ, not only are we empowered by the Holy Spirit who indwells the church, the body of Christ, but premise three, God's timing for the day of the Lord is connected to God's long suffering and his grace. Why would he restrain any longer? Why didn't he just get it over with? So remember in 2 Peter they said, uh, you know, there's this promise that Jesus is coming again, but God has never entered into history before. Peter writes, well, they're kind of ignorant on this. God did enter history before in the days of Noah and brought judgment upon those who were opposed to God. And, he said, and they under, misunderstand something this, that God is, his timetable is like different than ours because he's eternal. One day with the Lord is like what? Like a thousand years. So we're, we're, they're thinking there, it's been like 20, 30, 40 years since Christ made a promise he's not back. God's different. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some count slackness, but is 
long-suffering. He's restraining for a purpose. It's not that he can't accomplish the purpose of the return of Christ and making all things new. He is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The, The church of Jesus Christ has been given a mission to go to every tribe, every tongue, every nation, and bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to those who are enslaved by sin and under the wicked rule of the prince of this world and the prince of darkness. And with the gospel of Jesus Christ, people who are lost are going to be converted and saved and brought into the body of Christ. I'm just waiting. I'm long-suffering. I'm patient. But the day of the Lord will come. His purpose is the advancement of the gospel. His promise is the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, as Paul referenced in 1 Thessalonians 5, as Jesus spoke about it in the Olivet Discourse, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. The day of the Lord. This leads us to what I believe is a reasonable conclusion. I liked that one uh, scholar uh, who would not hold to our views gave a thumb sideways to what I'm going to say as a, as a reasonable explanation. Now, he's just completely wrong. It's actually a thumbs up. But this is a, an understanding, then, of the text built upon what we have just said. God's restraining work in the world today is mediated through the Spirit of God who fills the body of Christ. It is the church of Jesus Christ empowered by the Spirit that restrains the Antichrist, from initiating his program. He can't conquer the church. When the church is removed, caught up to meet the Lord in the air, 1 Thessalonians 4, that's why we looked at that, those words of comfort, the restraint will be removed and the man of lawlessness will be revealed and he will begin to focus his assault, interestingly, on Israel. You can read the text. We're going to bump it a little bit here in a moment. It's important to note the Holy Spirit will not be removed from the earth. He is God. Therefore, he is what? Omnipresent. There's no place in any place where he is not present in the fullness of his being at all times. This is why we did our little work. But he is mediating his work in and through the church of Jesus Christ at this time to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ as authorized by Jesus Christ and given the keys of the kingdom to bind on earth what they want to bind. The ministry of the Holy Spirit then through the church is what is going to be removed and therefore revealing that the redemptive work of God is to take his church out and now is the Antichrist, the one who comes in place of Christ, it will go into the temple and, and bring about the abomination of desolation, will focus his attention on assaulting the people, the nation of Israel. But it's interesting to note that the redemptive ministry of the Holy Spirit is going to continue through the tribulation, but not through the church of Jesus Christ. It's interesting, in Revelation uh, chapter 7, verses 3 and 4, we have this insight. Do not harm the earth as the judgments of God are going to be poured out in the time of tribulation. Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. And then it lists 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel in the text. We won't read that. 
But all of a sudden now Israel takes center stage and the tribes that are identified as the nation of Israel are revealed. And now God is going to work through these who are sealed to bring the hope of the faith in Jesus Christ empowered by the Spirit of God. There are also going to be, in Revelation 11, two witnesses that are going to come and be the means by which the Spirit of God can mediate the powerful gospel of Jesus Christ, the only hope of salvation that there has ever been. Then I was given a reed, John says, like a measuring rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and those who worship there, but leave out the court which is outside the temple, and do not measure it. Good. It's interesting we have the temple and the courts in the story of the revelation of Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation. For it has been given the, to the Gentiles that they should tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. That's an interesting number, isn't it? Uh, half of seven years. And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. So now there is going to be something that happens during the time of the tribulation with the testimony of those who are sealed by the grace of God, the 144,000, the two witnesses, so that we shouldn't be surprised when we see in Revelation chapter 7 this statement. After these things, I, John, looked, and behold, a great number, a multitude, which nobody could number of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and with palm branches and their hands and crying out with a loud voice saying salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb all the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying amen blessing and glory and wisdom thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever amen then one of the elders answered saying to me who are these arrayed in white arrayed in white robes. Where do they come from? And I said, sir, you know. That's, that's better than I don't know. <laughs> but that's what he's saying. I don't know, but you do. You're the one revealing all these things to me. So he said to me, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Do you understand that even when the Antichrist is, is unleashed and Satan empowers him with all lying signs and wonders, that there is going to be a great revival on the earth? And that God, for his glory, is going to redeem people all throughout this tribulation who turn in faith, they hear the truth, and they respond to the truth, and they are born again. They suffer for it, but they are saved to the glory of God. And we'll worship him forever and ever. A question. Why would Satan focus his attention on the nation of Israel in the temple? Jerusalem. Because the church will be gone. The bride of Christ taken to their father's house. John 14, 1 through 6. And Satan now will begin to focus his attention to prove that he is greater than God, that's his desire and goal, by defeating God's redemptive plan as pro and his promises to Israel. So here we have a, the arrival of the promises of, of, of the arrival of the Messiah and, and the song to perform the mercy Messiah's coming to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant the oath which he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear and holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life what is Satan's response Put the child to death. This is the one who is going to bring about the fulfillment of God's promises to Abraham and the covenant that he made. And I just remind you, we don't have time, but Romans 11, as he's working through in chapters 9 through 11, God's redemptive plan, he makes a statement. Concerning the gospel, they, the Jews, are enemies for your sake. They're persecuting the church at this time. But concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of of the fathers, 
Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. The enemy would delight in defeating the promises and the covenants of God so that God could no longer say, I am God, and when I say something, I will do it, and nobody can stop me. That's the plan of the enemy. The church will be gone, and now Satan will unleash his assault on those who are primarily Jews, but upon the world. Therefore, when it appears that Satan has, uh, through the Antichrist, is going to finally annihilate Israel in the city of Jerusalem, where God chose to put his name, we don't have time to read it, read Zechariah 14, Jesus is going to come again to earth as Israel's conquering king which he spoke about in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8. He will come and with the breath of his mouth, they're gone. No rival to Jesus Christ. But we can read about it in Revelation 19. And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse. He just came down from heaven in the white horse in that text. And against his army, then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone, and the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. Your time is done, Antichrist, beast, prophet. But it goes on. Then I saw an angel coming down, down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, all the way back to Genesis 3, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, restrained again, and he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. The millennial reign of Jesus Christ who has come to earth, saved his people, and will reign from his holy city, Zion, for a thousand years, as he promised. But after these things, even then, Satan is going to be released for a while, and a great battle happen again until there is final destruction. But God, in his grace and mercy, will fulfill his covenants and his promises to the fathers. This is why I believe that the hope that we have is blessed because that which restrains and the purpose of the restraint lines up with the story as told in Romans 9 through 11 and it means then that the return of Jesus Christ really does constitute a blessed hope for the church of Jesus Christ. In contrast, just to maybe make my point, If the return of Jesus means that the believers, the church, are going to experience cosmic chaos, be exposed to the unmitigated assault of Satan and his minions, and experience the most horrific persecution in the history of mankind, that does not sound like a blessed hope. That sounds like a living nightmare. That encourages an attitude of, even so, take your time, Lord Jesus, in coming again. I would rather just die in this life as good as it is now and and be transported into the very presence of God. I don't want to be alive when you come. But if the church will be delivered from the wrath to come, then we can say, even so what? Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Take us to be with you forever and reveal your glory in the fulfillment of your promises. Now, we know that many will be saved during the great tribulation, but we know this also, that during the tribulation there will be those, verses 11 and 12, who will reject the truth, did not love the truth, end of verse 10. And because of that, God will send them a strong delusion that they would believe the lie. We'll come back and look at that text next week. Let's close in prayer. Thank you, Lord, for your word. We've prayed that you would help us to divide it rightly and where I have been wrong, 
help people to forget it. But help us to live in this truth that, that Jesus Christ is coming again and he is our blessed hope. And may that hope purify us as we seek to live for him and bring about the glory of, of our Savior as we proclaim the message of Jesus Christ to a world that is in great need of it, that they might also be found ready when Christ returns. We pray in his name. Amen.